Welcome to the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. Alexis Sanchez stunningly saves a point at St. Mary's as Arsenal draw 1-1 away. This is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name is Elliot Smith, and you can block me on Twitter at Yankee Gunner. Yes, the only thing anybody wanted to talk about at full time was the stunning Alexis display, the brilliant pass he made, basically gifting it to Giroud's forehead so it couldn't be missed. That's why we love Alexis Sanchez. That's why everyone is pretty much in agreement that he is the star of this team and needs to stay forever. But we will get to that and maybe players that people are a little less excited about as we discuss the 1-1 draw away to St. Mary's, uh, not to St. Mary's, to Southampton, not St. Mary's, with Tim. You can find him on Twitter at Stilberto. Hello, Tim. Hello there. And Clive. You can find him on Twitter at Clive P-A-F-C. Hi, Clive. Hello, hello. Hey, interesting t- statistic, you guys. Do you know that two seasons ago we lost 4-0 at St. Mary's? <laughs> we did. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, four nil. So we improved by four goals over our result just two short seasons ago. Um, that's an inside joke for the podcast. But uh, there was a previously recorded opening that may have mistook that result for being last season's result. In any event, um, so we got a lot to get to. Scott will be along with a short seven minute little stat section. It'll fly right by, but it'll come up in a bit. Talks quite a bit about Alexis um, in the short time that he's on. But Tim, let's start. And I want to ask you. Um, were you surprised to see Murtisacker come back into the side? No, not at all. Because and and I listen. Obviously, I listened to the podcast that I wasn't on uh, after Barte. Well, I after we sent you the check, go, you better have. <laughs> <laughs> I always felt he'd go back to a back three. The telltale sign was the fact that Murtisacker wasn't involved against Barte, which told me that he was going to start this game. And uh, I think he purely went for the back four against Barte because he didn't have anyone that could play right wing back. Reese Nelson's been carrying a knock. Um, Benga doesn't think Debushi can quite do that role. He tried Callum Chambers there. It didn't work. So I think that was kind of more of um, a move of convenience. I was uh, I was convinced that we'd go back to a back three and the Mertesacker would start. And uh, after that, you know, the rest of this 11 recently has been kind of picking itself. So there, there were no surprises um, for me. I, I suppose a small surprise, which I've not seen anyone talk about at all, was that... Um, Theo Walcott didn't make the bench, which uh, probably tells you quite a bit about how he's seen at the moment well, and the well, fact Tim, that's generated he, no he, discussion. He established his transfer value at Bate. Don't ruin it now. Now keep him as far <laughs> from the team as possible. Have that be the last memory that agents and teams have in, of him. And, you know, I'm kidding. I don't want to see Theo go. But, you know. Anyway, keep going. Yeah, so, I mean, that that was probably the big surprise. And even I, I didn't really know that until I, I just watched the highlights before recording this pod. So that, that seems to have slipped under the radar a little bit. Um, but no, other than that, I, I was I was not surprised at all um, to see Mertesacker start. I think, uh, and I've said this a few times this season, the, one of the most interesting things about the Europa League lineups is it tells you exactly who's going to play the next game um, by, by dint of who's absent. And the fact that Mertesacker, that Sack wasn't involved, just told me he was playing. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Now, I guess the next question then is, without getting into the game at large, and we'll, you know, we'll come on to the individual mm-hmm. moments and mistakes and all that, is this the kind of performance, watching him you know, as the game developed, as we gave away the goal, nervous about holding the line, I mean, is this the kind of game that maybe led you to believe that maybe he should call time on the playing side of his career? Yeah, it, it does kind of look to be getting that way. Um, I, I think, I mean, Wenger said something about the players having uh, the Manchester United game in their minds at the beginning. There might be something to that, but I got the feeling they were just a little bit less aggressive. And that's maybe because in the back of their minds, they, um, you know, they they felt like they should be a bit deeper, maybe because of Mertesacker. Um but I, I think overall, although he really didn't have a very good performance, and I think he'll know that as well. And maybe he might argue that's because he's getting infrequent, irregular football and it's difficult for him to find a rhythm um, as much as anyone else. But I, I think where Southampton really, particularly in the early stages, they traded on the confusion between Arsenal's wing back and Arsenal's wide centre back. And they were finding that space and creating that confusion on both sides, um, it must be said, uh, quite a lot. But yeah, it, it, it's kind of one of those things that reminds you that all of our centre halves, um, you know, Bar Mustafi, uh, all of our centre halves on display are in their 30s. And we're just coming into the stage of the season where 
because most of them have been excused in the Europa League this is the first time that they're really being asked to play twice a week and yeah. perhaps it's beginning to show in some of them and you know obviously Ramsey got injured and um, this this is the period of the season where that's going to happen and this fairly settled lineup we've had for the last month or so you know it, it will be broken up um, that's inevitable and um, I think maybe you're seeing a little bit of that as well but usually with Mustafi there as well he's a little bit you know he's he's not fantastically reliable he's he I think he's played generally quite well this season although he does seem to have a rick in him but he does at least cover ground um quite well and I think he covers ground into the channels quite well which Mertesacker can't really do yeah. um and you know Southampton they're, they're they're pretty tricky up front now now they've dropped Charlie Austin in there and they have Tadic playing off of him um, they so, did well on yeah, the goal. It, I mean, obviously it was our yeah. error, but I, I, I don't think enough has yeah. been made of how expertly they they executed that transition. Yeah, 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 yeah. They did. Um, you know, twice they they kind of closed the ball down, but it's it's a very nice ball from reverse pass from Tadic, which caught Monreal out, and it's it's a nice finish as well. But it it does it did feel um, we're too quick at. So a lot of things that have come out of this game that have just made me think, my God, as, you know, as football fans nowadays, we're so quick to come to definitive conclusions after every game. But That's um, absolutely 100% not true, but okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it did kind of feel like a, you know, a, a bit of an end of days performance um, from Mertesacker and we're probably seeing why the manager you know, hasn't really trusted him except in fairly dire circumstances and I wonder if over the Christmas period um, Rob Holding and Callum Chambers who just seems to be completely out of favour whether they might get a bit more of a look in, in in the coming weeks. I mean yeah unless he switches to a back four but I mean the the interesting thing Tim is I you know Calvin Masterson on, on Twitter makes this point a lot, and I, I think it is a valid one. We often talk about players losing a step who are pacey players, right? Like a Theo Walcott, mm. like, oh, what will Theo be when he loses a step? But it's actually the slow players who maybe are more impacted by losing a step because they may have just enough pace to be functional, but the minute they lose yeah. a step, they become dysfunctional, that, that they are too slow to be usable. And I saw something from Pear that was worrying, which was the line was pretty even, but he was dropping deeper than the line because I don't think he, yeah. he favored himself if he had to turn and run towards goal, and that's that's a bad sign. Yeah, I, I think I think that is a good point. I My view on it is that basically all players suffer pretty much equally from losing but from not so much just from losing pace, but when their body begins to change, you know, they have to adjust to the changes in their body. And some players will do that better than others. But whether it's, you know, losing a bit of pace, losing a bit of strength, um, you know, and I, I think we're kind of seeing it maybe with Jack Wilshere as well. He's readjusting to what his body can actually do. And he's having to change his style a little bit. Mm -hmm. That affects all players, um, yep. no matter how athletic, athletic or big or strong or small or how, however they are. When your body changes on you and you have to adapt your game, that that's very difficult. Yeah, and and Clive, so there's a little note for you. I mean, as your body starts to change, your voice will deepen. So just wait for that. That'll happen. Um, <laughs> no, I look forward to that. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I think with Murtisacker, I still believe he, he reads the game. He's intelligent. I, he's, he's not bad with the ball at his feet. I think... When he has to defend close to his, his goal, he can still be useful at that. We saw him not so long ago, what was it, where he was brilliant and you know was dominant in the air. There was a game recently he played well for us, um, but it's escaping me. Anybody got it off the top of their head? A Murtisacker game where he did well recently? That's one of the Europa ones, but I can't did, remember. Did I, did I invent this? In any event, I mean, it's, it's the point, though, that when he has to step out in space and hold, hold a bit of a higher line, I just I, I don't see how we can throw him out there. So, Clive, you've talked about this a lot. You've made the point on other podcasts that we, we play in the wrong areas. Um, individually, none of these guys are bad on the ball. I mean, Koscielny's good on the ball. Murda Sacker is good with the ball at feet. Um, uh, Monreal can, can dribble and pass, and our wingbacks are certainly fine on the ball. And yet... We consistently make these unforced errors and give the ball away in our own area. Is this structural? Is it Ramsey bombing forward and only Shaka in the midfield and being forced to play into tighter spots against the touchdown? Like what? What is causing us to continually make these unforced errors and give the ball away under in dangerous situations, despite the fact that we have pretty competent ball playing defenders? It's really good that we've got um, a bit of a sample size now when we prepare properly. 
and when we don't. Right. So let's look at Spurs, for example. Against Spurs, we started the game absolutely perfectly. We had a plan. We we gave them the ball. We had a press that was were unified. We learned from the Man City game where it was Alexis on his own. And we immediately played in the areas we wanted to play in, much higher up. We had an aggressive centre-half in Mustafi that plays higher up and wants to push in. And so he's so, when he pushes in, he doesn't push halfway in, he goes all the way. And he tears through people and he, com- he creates incidents. He either gets a foul or he gets the ball. And so what you have was on the three pistons at the back driving in, a much higher line, which means Ramsey's got less space to run, run around into, which means he can play higher, Shaka can play higher, and the whole unit looks good. That's when we get it right. And then we just roll into Manchester United. We just roll into them. And, and to me, we had to do the same sort of plan. And we just started to play. We felt confident. Now, oh, let's just play through the thirds. We get trapped. We get cut off on the, on the cross balls. And basically, we find ourselves 2-0 down because we haven't prepared properly. And, and Southampton felt very, very similar to me. Uh, on, on the TV I was watching... They, I, I was, it was a very snowy day, right? So I was watching everything. I was watching warm-up videos. I was watching everything. And you can see from before the game that Southampton were out 10, 15 minutes before us. They were more aggressive. They were more much ready to start that game. We came out with about 55 different layers on. And we did a, a very slow warm-up. And guess what? The game started and we weren't ready, right? So and these things, I mean, people will laugh, but you can lose games in the warm-up. Whenever I go and watch Arsenal, I always watch the warm-up, if I can. I always want to see what's happening beforehand because I've seen games lost in warm-ups. It's a coach's trick to get your players out there early, to try and intimidate the opposition, try and take over their ground. Particularly Manchester United do it very well when they come to our place. And and, and we, we just don't prepare properly to start every game. And we can do it sometimes. We did it for Spurs. We did it at Chelsea. And you can tell an Arsenal team in the first three or four minutes when they're focused and ready to go. Everton, another example. The ball was moving quickly. Possession team. But we had the ball. And it was flying in the first three or four minutes. And you immediately sit back. You think, it's on today. It feels good. And then you look at the game on, on Sunday and you just think, we're not, we're not ready to play. We could have been 3 nil down at the start. Yeah, yeah, so they, had, they had lots of chances. <laughs> I think it's preparation. Go ahead. We could have, Charlie Austin could have had a hat-trick, right? He could have had a hat-trick. No, yeah. you're, you're right. And, and you're sitting there thinking, OK, this is Manchester United again. Manchester United scored two, and Southampton can only score one. And that's the only reason why we got a draw, because we our goal scoring record away from home has been highlighted. We, we weren't scoring two goals in that game. No way. So we were just fortunate they, that Czech made a save and Southampton were a little bit wasteful. And once we got the rust out of our legs, we started to play and then we realised actually they're not very good. But by then now, we've got a packed defence to play against and, and that highlight other issues, which I'm sure we'll get onto later. Yeah, I, I agree with all that. And Tim, I mean, it, it is unfortunate to go down that early away because what happens is, you know, when you're away, there is some onus on the home team, even when they're a smaller club to come at you a bit, right? I mean, mm. when you're at home, you have to attack a little bit. That's At least that's sort of how it, how it seems to happen. But you give them that early goal, and you let them sit in a low block and counter. And unlike the United game, where we were actually scintillating an attack as they sat, tried to sit back, and they really didn't seem like they ever were organized enough, Southampton looked very organized and comfortable repelling us. Um, this, this game actually followed the pattern I would have expected from the United game. You know, um, mm. them looking very comfortable keeping us out and, and counterattacking, creating chances that way. But the question I have for you, so a- a- after we fell behind, I was watching the way we were building play. And Koscielny was 25 yards from their goal. Monreal was 25 yards from their goal. A lot of the final third mm. passes we were attempting, a lot of the entry passes into the final third were having to be made by center backs. And, you yeah. know, if you plot passing percentages... The further from the opposition goal you are, that's the highest passing percentage. The closer you get to the opposition goal, obviously, the passing percentages drop, right? Mm. So if your center backs are 25 yards from their goal trying to play final third entry passes, those are going to be tougher passes, more likely to be incomplete. And if they are incomplete, well, where's your center back standing? 25 Mm. yards from their goal, right? And he's got to bum Achilles and he's got to run all the way back. Um, 
I guess my question to you is, if that's how we're going to try to build the play, push everybody into their half to chase the game, and it's Koscielny and Monreal, should the manager have made the switch immediately? Should he have gone to a back four, brought in an extra midfielder, so it's not your center backs 25 yards from goal, but a little more control in the center of the pitch, in the advanced areas, you know, making, making those passes from midfielders instead of center backs? Yeah, maybe. I think um, I, we spoke about this a little bit last week about how uh, Xhaka and Ramsey, how they set up and how they quite often play a different game in the first half compared to the second half. And in the first half, they really push up. And, th- and what that means is that then the centre halves are the ones who are relied on to make those kind of line breaking passes, which Mustafa is really good at, um, certainly. Um, but it, it kind of feels like, do you remember the Swansea home game where Swansea went 1-0 up? Um, and we were faced with their kind of deep block. And actually that that um, tactic of pushing Xhaka and Ramsey up, it, it stops working, basically, when teams have just got nine or ten behind the ball. Yeah. Um, and what we did against Swansea very well was we dropped, we then you know had the half-time team talk and said, right, they're sitting off. Xhaka, you come ten yards backwards and start hitting the, the wing backs. Um, and actually, curiously, what happened was that Arsenal didn't really use the width of the pitch and the way that they did against Swansea and the way they said, right, okay, they're going to sit back. They're being compact. Um, let's hit the wings. Let's hit the wing backs. Let's hit Bayer in and let's hit Kolasinac in particular um, and try and get them to stretch the defence out of shape. And that never really happened. Um, even in the second half, we weren't, you know, we didn't change up the delivery of what we were doing. Um, so it kind of felt like the early goal threw us off plan. Um, and, you know, Man United exploited you know, Man United had done their homework. They realised that um, Arsenal put, you know, a little bit of pressure on their centre halves to be ball players as well. And United right. realised this early on, and they they went for it, and you know they they got change out of it. Um, and and you know Southampton kind of realised this as well. And that was one of my worries of last week, actually, that United had really set a blueprint for playing against this team. And I, th- I think we kind of saw that. But, you know, against Swansea, and I, I, I accept that Southampton are much better than Swansea, and particularly at St Mary's. But, you know, in, at Swansea, we had that kind of plan B for the second half where we sat Xhaka off another 10 yards and, and had him playing those passes. But we didn't really do that. And uh, I think Adrian Clark picked out very nicely on on his breakdown. I'm going to give him credit now rather than just stealing his ideas and um, you do both. passing them off as, as, as my own. Um, but he was talking about the ang- you, you were talking there about how close Koscielny and Monreal, for example, were to the Southampton goal. And he picked out some examples exactly the same. But he was saying nobody was giving the angle for the pass. First of all, first off, the wing backs weren't wide enough which didn't create that kind of that angled pass out wide, mm-hmm. um, which which we use quite a lot that we slip in between the centre backs to try and get our wing backs in behind. But he was kind of saying n- nobody was stood in, a, everyone was just kind of standing behind Southampton players instead of looking for pockets of space. And uh, yeah, it was, it's just, uh, you know, it, it's always really, really difficult to play against a nine-man defence, no, no matter what you try and do. If you try and go direct, if you try and pick through them, if you try and shoot through them, it, 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 that's just life. It's really, really difficult. That's why teams do it um, and why most of them get you know some success from doing it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it, it just kind of feels like the, neither of the wing-backs were really at the races. Um, they weren't creating those kind of angled angled. Uh, angled passes they weren't really showing for the players in midfield and um, and then what we got instead was kind of and I'm sure we'll get onto well I know we'll get onto this we just <clears throat> excuse me had Alexis kind of trying to break down the door yeah. as it were so one, uh, one man battering ram yeah yeah off, off the ball we, we weren't really sharp enough with our movement I think the problem I see, Tim, is like when we are chasing a game all too often, what happens is we just push those center backs up the pitch and we push the midfielders up the pitch and then the wing backs and the forwards stand in a straight line across the edge of the 18-yard box and there's no one between the lines. They're just in a line on the edge of the box. There's no dimension. There's no one to come between the lines to receive the ball to pull a defender out. You know what I mean? To follow them into that space so there are channels and lanes to run into. If everybody's standing at the edge of the 18-yard box in a line, it makes it very easy for the defense. They just hold that line. When someone comes forward between the lines to receive the ball, a defender has to make a decision whether to stand off that player 
and mm. you know th- then you can get killed if you give someone that kind of room that close to goal or to follow that player and create the space behind where they vacated for someone to make a run and we just that seems basic and we don't seem to do it um, you know I think the, the other thing that makes us really vulnerable to press if you can find it I'm going to forget which account it was but there was an account on Twitter that posted three pictures of us in the first phase of our attack and build up and it's really really instructive I think it shows the center backs with the ball Shaka bracketed by two Southampton midfielders and Ramsey's gone he's already up the pitch he's already with the forwards and the only ball is to the wing backs. And there are Southampton players that have them screened. So it's either hopeful long ball or it's give it to the wing backs against mm. the touch line and under pressure. Shaq is not an option. And it really chokes off how we want to build the play. And what winds up happening is that Koscielny or Nacho winds up carrying it, carrying it a little further, carrying it a little fo- further. Um, that, that just is not effective. And I, I do think we have to start to ask ourselves in these away games, you know, against smaller sides that, that can sit and defend. Do we need to bring that extra midfielder in? Is, is the back three mm-hmm. not a, a formation against smaller teams that we can really afford to, to keep playing like this? Um, but, you know, I, I guess that's a question for another day. I had actually kind of thought that maybe we were going to go to a back four in this game, um, and, you know, we didn't. And obviously, that's why I should be manager, but whatever. No one's offering me the job. Gazidis, you've got my number. Give me a call. Any event, Clive. Um, so, you know, we made some chances early on. I mean, uh, Lacazette had a chance where he blasted over. There was a counterattack where he had it taken off his toe. Uh, Ramsey had a shot really nicely saved down low from a, a nice Alexis um, uh, pass into the box. But we didn't, we didn't really trouble them the way... You know, obviously the way we did against United, but in, we didn't trouble them in general. And I think one of the players that wasn't able to influence this game the way he has been influencing them is Ramsey. Um, maybe it's because against a low block, his secondary runs don't really come into effect. Or maybe it's because... Um, you know, well, that, that would be my answer. I don't have another one. But <laughs> the, I guess my question to you is... You know, Ramsey hasn't come under the kind of scrutiny after this game that maybe like a Shaq or Alexis did. And we'll come on to those guys. But... Why do you think Ramsey struggled to impact this game the way he has this season? He's been in such red-hot form, but this this game, it, it wasn't happening for him. Yeah, you sort of touched it there already. I think he likes to move the ball sort of simply. And then when we got secure possession, he likes to join the top end. And if it breaks down, he likes to run back into his spot. And he almost does one and a half jobs. So he's a third man runner and he likes a start position from centre midfield. Very difficult. Stylistically, I've had issues with him, as I've said many times, that I think he vacates too much. He's getting better at that. But this game, I think he struggled because there's nowhere to run. They were very compact. And he didn't really offer the security in midfield. I think that's a lot. That's not that's just his style. That's not a criticism. That's just who he is. He's not a Jack Wilshere. He's not a Sandy Cazorla. He doesn't manipulate the ball like they do. He's a strong, running, driving player. And there was nowhere to drive. And if you're driving, you need people to bounce off you and to and to run and penetrate. And we're talking about, and Tim's point about Swansea is a really good one. We switched to play really quickly. And once we have had people isolated on the far side, we sprinted over, created a one-two, and we drove the shoulders, the inside shoulders of centre-backs, and we penetrated and we did low crosses into the box. And what we didn't have, we didn't have the penetration until Welbeck came on. We had wing-backs that weren't, didn't have a connection with Urza and Sanchez because they weren't really connecting with them. And so there was no wall pass, there was no drive, there was no penetration. And so we just was conservative and we just played around. Mm-hmm. And I think Ramsey, without trying to criticise him, he, 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 just, he just wasn't his game. I always say that every game has his own story. And he likes the breaking games, he likes space to run into, he likes a competition. He likes a fight. There was no fight. We had the ball. They had their goal. And they were just sitting in. There was no fight. There was no battle. There was no one to push back. There was no Kante to mark. There was nobody there for him to get Engage stuck into. Him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was nothing for him to do. And now you're looking for someone to say, what can you do on the ball, Aaron? What you, what you got on the ball? That's not his game. He likes a fight. So that's why he does well in some of the top games, right? So I, I, I always say that his style is, is does it suit us it suits us for some days and it doesn't suit us for others and this was one of the days it didn't suit us and of course he broke down injury last sort of 15-20 minutes and was basically a passenger so 
it wasn't really a massive game to to judge him on. Yeah. But I think um, him and Shaq are really, they didn't really grab hold of this game. And I think that was part of the reason why Alexis dropped deep. Because he didn't trust them to do the job that he wanted. He wanted to do their job and his own job. And he needs to trust them that they can deliver the ball into the right areas. But I'm not sure they can, actually, because I'm not sure they can drop it on a dime. I think Shaq has got the range. Ramsey's a receiver of passes, and that's why Alexis was coming deep, because I don't think he trusts him in the midfield. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Look, I mean, it's it's not that he was terrible. It's that he just he struggled to influence the game, and he's been so influential, so it stood out to me. And we're going to talk a little later on about what we do now to replace him as he's out with a hamstring injury. But uh, I, know, I know that that is shocking news you never expected to hear. But there it is. Um, I think... What we should do real quick, we should come on to Alexis because it is a big talking point and, and it seems to be the debate of the day. Uh, then we can talk a little bit about the, the goal that equalized, the result, where it stands in the context of the season, the Europa draw a little bit. we got a lot more to come on to, but let's do this. Let's hear from Scott, get the stats. Uh, he'll tell you a little bit more about Alexis' day from a uh, statistical analysis standpoint, and then we'll come back, uh, ignore everything he told us, and get really, really mad about how terrible Alexis is. We'll be right back. Okay, Scott is here to give us a statistical analysis that will clarify for you that we did not play well. Uh, again, it is always important that we use the data to tell us what our eyes have already told us, and we are thrilled that Scott is here to do that. Scott is on Twitter at O underscore that underscore crab. You can find his work on crabstats.blogspot.com. Hello, Scott. Hello. Yeah, so uh, look, not uh, a match that any of us are going to be uh, firing up over the summer when we miss Arsenal, especially us Americans who won't have any reason to watch the World Cup. We're not going to be watching this one again, not a classic, but we did salvage a point. Uh, from a statistical standpoint, how the performance looked to you? Um, I, a fortunate result. Uh, so I had Arsenal with a uh, 18% or a 13% chance of getting a win and a 30% chance of getting a draw. And there was a 56% chance that they were they should have lost this match. Um, they were um, out XG'd in this match. And one of the other things is they only created um, 11 shots, which is really not good, especially for a team that was chasing the game uh, for 97 minutes or something like that. I mean, compare that to the United game where we were chasing the game and we created whatever it was, 33 shots or something. Um so you would think that game state would have led to more shots, but in fact, we were pretty low on shots. So what did the XG come out for you for the match? Uh, overall, um, Arsenal had 0.58. Okay, to Southampton's? 1.19. Okay, so not just uh, not a win, but not an XG win, which is, you know, we've been champions of XG, and now we, now we don't even have that to put on our mantle. Um, as far as individual performances go, well, before we get to that, one stat that you told me right before we hit the record button that I thought was interested in, no big chances in the match whatsoever. Yeah, so this is the, the third time that this has happened on the season. Um, the other one was uh, against Liverpool and also um, against uh, Manchester City. Um, this is also the, the lowest um, XG that Arsenal have in my database. Um, again, you know, just beating out those other two matches. So overall, Arsenal were, you know, they were on a high with their XG that they've been producing over the last few weeks. And I even had them um, coming up into the the second best offense, and then as soon you know, as soon as we start talking them up, they have a, a dip in form. Which they, is they'll always do that to you, Scott. They do that. Yep. Yeah. They they always want to play a uh, you know rope a dope with you, lead you to think they're moving in the right direction, and then they zig, you zag, and you wind up with a one one draw. Although could be could be worse. Could have been a four 0 loss. We've seen that at uh, St. Mary's. But so um, to the individual performances. And the person who's getting a lot of attention, as is always the case, big player, whether he's having a stinker or uh, a worldie, is Alexis Sanchez. I think a lot of people are putting a lot of blame on him. Statistically, you don't see him as quite the villain of the piece, though. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say that he had a great game, but he was one of the the few players that um, really was having any sort of a creative spark. Um, So I know Mesut Ozil led the team in passing value added, but... Uh, surprisingly, he didn't create any um, key passes. Um, Alexis Sanchez um, had three key passes on the day, including the one that turned into the goal for Arsenal. And um, you'll see the the stat going around talking about the number of giveaways he had, and I believe it was 32. But of those, most of those were were bad passes, and a lot of those come from him trying to do things. Um, Overall, his his negative passing was negative 0.3, 
which isn't great, but compared to his um, positive passing that he added, which was 0.8, he came out um, positive with a 0.5 value added with passing, so that that's his passing was worth about half a goal um, overall, which is really good. So, I mean, the things he was doing well, at least statistically, the way you tabulate this, were more than uh, countering the things he was doing poorly. Again, it's not to say that he didn't have negative contributions. It's simply that the way you calculate the statistics, the positive contributions outweighed it. I mean, is that what you're seeing? Exactly. So overall, um, looking at things, so I, I try to, to you know take everything into account that um, a player does on the ball. So dribbles, um, moving the ball um, with passing, carrying the ball, um, and then also look at you know how many times they've been dispossessed and how many times they misplayed passes. Um, and then also I try to add in the XG um, that's not caught in there. And overall, he was worth 0.2. Uh, so this is, I scale this to goals to make it um, at least a little bit more comprehensive and easier to understand. So his his value his net value added in terms of goals to Arsenal was 0.2, which was third best on Arsenal uh, behind Mesut Ozil, Alexa, um, Aaron Ramsey, and Granit Xhaka. So he was behind those three, so he was fourth best? Yes. Okay. And I mean, it's ironic, right? Because I think there are a lot of people that would say Shaq, I had a stinker. Alexis was terrible. Um, and, you know, ultimately, that can still be true, even in the face of these statistics. But it's the point that at least in terms of the statistics, we can measure what he was doing that was hurting the side was outweighed by the things he was doing to help, to help the side as far as data goes. Exactly. So and this is really more just the, the offensive value. Um, I haven't tried to put any value on um, defensive things so you can definitely um, poke that uh, with the, the defensive you know deficiencies that Arsenal had right. especially early in the match so this is not going to get capture any of those things and you'll have to use your eyes to, to try to use those to help you out one last little tidbit that I thought was interesting you mentioned to me um, in terms of the kinds of passes that can be hurtful the the through balls that people run on to uh, not a one of them connected in this match Exactly. So, yeah, Arsenal lead the league in um, attempted through balls and completed through balls um, with over six a game, and they complete two and a half a game. And this match, they only had one uh, from Alexis Sanchez, and that one did not come off. Um, so you could definitely see Southampton packing the box, and Arsenal were having all sorts of trouble unlocking them. Uh, there was a lot of that sterile possession where they were passing in the, the U-shape around, and nobody could really find that final killer ball. So, I mean, I guess the lesson here with Game State, unlike the lesson in the Manchester United game, is when you gift a team a goal, sometimes it means you go on the all-out attack and batter them, but sometimes it means they can sit compact and organized in a low block and you can't break them down. You can't find the space. Yes, this would be more of the, the typical uh, Game State-affected match. Uh, so Arsenal ended up with way more shots than Southampton, but Southampton ended up with the better of the chances because they were able to sit back on the counter um, even after they scored their goal, um, they ended up uh, matching Arsenal um, XG-wise. So even though Arsenal were taking a ton of shots, Southampton's one big chance that they had on the counter was worth more than all of those pot shots that Arsenal were taking. Yeah, and I guess the lesson here, and I mean, I realize it's one that you need advanced metrics to understand, and maybe that's why the team doesn't get it. Maybe they're not looking at these metrics the way Scott is, the way, of course, I am. The lesson may be, don't give away stupid early goals. Um, if only someone would tell Arson and the team. But until they do, we'll have to suffer through this kind of thing. In any event, uh, Scott's on Twitter at O underscore that underscore crab. Uh, he is the guy you should direct abuse to for defending Alexis Sanchez, not me. Uh, you can find his work on crabstats.blogspot.com. Scott, appreciate it. We will uh, look forward to speaking to you after the 10 no win at West Ham. Awesome. Take yeah, it. I decided the Alexis is my hill that I'm going to die on. Well, you know what? Uh, it's a beautiful dog-filled hill, and you'll be able to throw the ball and run and chase and, and have your, your fur blow in the breeze. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Okay, so there you have it. Great day for Alexis. Nothing for us to disagree about. We can move on. No, I'm kidding. We have to get to the part where we slayed him and kick him out of our club. So, Tim. <clears throat> Tim. Yeah. God, this fucking Alexis Sanchez guy. What a drag, man. When are we going to get some good players? <laughs> um, all kidding aside, I mean, y you told me something that I thought was really interesting, and I'll let you share it, but basically that everything that was good about our attack came from Alexis. 
Uh, not to say that he had the day of his life, but this this has become a very uh, polarizing player, uh, despite what seems to still be his incredible influence on on our attack and especially on our end product. Mm. Yeah, I mean, so I, I think pretty much every shot on target um, was either, well, I think other the free kick was the only shot on target he had, but I think all of our shots on target came from Alexis passes. Now, um, you could make a very reasonable argument and say, well, yeah, he because he kept running to the ball so much that nobody else really had to, was given the opportunity to make a pass into the area. And, you know, of the kind of four or five shots that we produced... Um, you know, just by by kind of dint of numbers, um, inevitably one or two of them were going to come from Alexis. Yeah, if you make four hundred attempts at a at a final third entry yeah. pass, eventually you're going to lead to a shot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, there's always been this kind of Alexis tariff. We know he turns the ball over a lot, and generally I'm quite relaxed about it when he does it. You know, when he's looking for the through ball, for example, I'm I'm kind of fine with that. Um, and Arsene Wenger's comment was asked about it afterwards, which shows that this is a debate that goes wider than our fan base. Because uh, he had a journalist asked him about it, and he he said something I can't, can't remember his exact words, but he said something like, um, "We want him closer to goal." And I think that's what he means. I think that he means, look, I don't, don't mind if you get a sixty-seven percent pass completion or whatever, because you're trying through balls and they're just not coming off, but when you're giving the ball away like 40 yards from goal, then it becomes a bit of a problem. Um, but I, I think this debate, and, and there's no doubting that Alexis is, by his own exalted standards, he is not playing well. There is no doubting that. But I, I find this argument, like a lot on social media, it's just going too far the other way. And the willingness everybody has to completely discount the fact that in our last four games, he has either set up or scored a goal, um, which, which shows you um, what a brilliant player he is because he's playing pretty miserably, but he's still producing something in every single game. And, um, you know, p- people get annoyed about that little dink over the top, and I get it, but it came off. Um, you know, he, he was finally given really something to hit in that respect, <clears throat> because Giroud and Welbeck, uh, Welbeck was there if Giroud hadn't have, uh, got his head on that, by the way. Um, but also, he, he hit a wonderful pass to Bellerin in the first half, and he produced a cutback, which Lacazette put over. That that you pass know, to Bellerin was sensational, yeah. by the way. That That's one to go back and watch again. It's really good. Yeah. And, and the um, entry ball to Ramsey that Ramsey sh- shoots exactly. low and is saved. Yep. That's another really slick, nice pass. I mean, Ozil who kind of skated by in this game, he did fine, but like he didn't make any of those, you know, and we usually yeah. think of Ozil as the player who does that. Yeah. And, and in, and then, but then there is the other side of the argument, which is not nonsensical at all. There's a lot of sense in it that Ozil wasn't really allowed to because, and this is where Alexis's game was frustrating because Alexis kept taking it upon himself and he did kill our rhythm a bit. There's absolutely no doubt about that the decisions he made in terms of going to get the ball were not always good. And I think that was part of the reason, again, I, I advise you to watch uh, Adrian Clark's uh, breakdown when he makes this point about, you know, none of the players were making an angle to receive the ball. And I do think a lot of it was because it just became kind of death by Alexis. You know, it was like, oh, he's gone to pick the ball up again, 40 yards from goal. And it becomes a bit, when the whole team's not involved, you know, and you're just standing there watching one player uh, try to they do just, it. They just stood there, Tim. They just stood yeah. there watching him. I yeah, see and it. exactly. And and I can understand how it becomes a bit dispiriting. I, um, you know, a lot of people know I, I watch Brazil a lot. And prior to Cheech taking over, this used to happen with Neymar for Brazil because Neymar and Alexis, they're very, very similar. They've both got quite big egos. Um, they want the ball all the time. And, you know, what Neymar was doing for Brazil was dropping back to the halfway line, trying to beat the whole team on his own. And he'd manage it once a game, but the rest of the game, he'd just piss everyone off. And they wouldn't go looking for the ball because they'd just go, oh, what's the point? Neymar's going to pick it up and, uh, you know, he'll try another one of his mazy dribbles. And if he gets to me, fine. But if not, not going to worry about it. And and there is an element, there was an element of that um, in this game as well. And I, I do think that, some of our kind of more explosive players or our players with that bit of movement 
were perhaps not I wouldn't say demoralized that's that's going over the top but you know it becomes monotonous basically when the game doesn't have that variety and and I do think Alexis does have a tendency when we go a goal down um, to panic a little bit I remember a couple of years ago he came on in an FA Cup game I forget who it was against it was Hull at home and uh, it was nil nil and he came on with 20 minutes to go and basically he just proceeded to blast shot after shot into the North Bank up a tier and, and Wenger came as close as he ever comes to criticising an individual player he didn't pick Alexis out but he said we panicked too much in the last 20 minutes and we went for individual solutions rather than team based solutions and I, I think he very much had Alexis in mind so um, you know there, there was an element of forcing it but on the other you know on the, on the other side of that you know he created that goal against Manchester United he created the equaliser for Giroud he scored against Spurs you know he, he's still coming up with decisive moments even though he's he scored in the winning kind of, penalty against what was it Burnley right I mean yeah, all yeah. the pressure on yep and and all this kind of talk of dropping him, I, I think a lot of that's kind of social media posturing because it's, it's fine. I understand why people are saying that. I get it. I don't agree. But are you going to feel but better then, seeing the team sheet come out an hour before the match and seeing that it's a Wobie or Welbeck instead yeah, of Alexis? Ex- exactly. I, you know, exactly. Put yourself in the manager's situation on Wednesday night. It's your job. It's your balls on the line. It's you that puts up with all the grief. Are you going to pick Alexis or are you going to pick Danny Welbeck? I mean, remember the um, Liverpool game? Was it last you know, season where he quote unquote disciplined him and yeah. and didn't start him for half the game because he had you know gotten into a, a, an argument, I guess, on the training pitch? And like, we didn't come out fired up because Alexis wasn't in the in the game and passing all around no. them, and suddenly we were fluent. We were fucking horrible, so bad that he had to no. be brought on at halftime to try to rescue us. <laughs> um, I, I think I think basically the main takeaway here is there's always a bit of yin and yang when you play Alexis Sanchez. It's largely um, it's largely good, and there's some bad at the moment. The but like the the kind of the heat map on the bad is coming up, but I do think that people are too quick to completely dismiss the good. You know, like you're seeing loads of people going, "Oh, he's, he's shit! I hate him. Sell him. Kill him. Uh, whatever." He, he doesn't want to be but here. Then, is my favorite one. Like people yeah, can uh, tell that. Like, I mean, it, yeah. he's, he, like he's not trying. Is that? Does anyone think Alexis isn't trying? I know, <laughs> and people people reach for these tropes. I think because there's so much pressure on us as as fans, you know, to be pundits and and analysts, and we. It, it's kind of the same with Bellerin, and I'm sure we'll get onto that. P- people are looking for reasons, you know, like, oh, he's grown his hair, and um, he puts loads of pictures on Instagram, he's lost his focus. I think the expression is flash cunt. <laughs> yeah, and, and he's got no competition, so he's all complacent. And it's like, can't it just be that he's in bad form? It, is that not allowed anymore? Why do, you know, can't, can't that just be it, that he's 21 and he plays a lot and, you know, he's... He's just hit a bit of bad form. And it's kind of the same here. Like, you can't look at Alex. If anything, he's trying too hard, Yeah, um, I, which which he does, you know, which he does do quite often. So, you know, it's, you know, I, I'm in no mood to discount the bad. I see it. But I do also see the good. And I do also see that he's won us some points, even in this pretty poor patch of form for him. So yeah. he, he's still making a difference. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's tough. I tweeted after the match, and I really believe that this, this was a fantastic game and performance to pick on the player you don't like because yeah. no one was good. You know, no no one yeah. comes out of that totally free of criticism. I mean, maybe you could say Giroud does, but I actually thought the subs were dreadful until he scored. I thought they made us worse, if that's possible. Um so, you know, I mean, there's no one came out of that game where you could say, well, other than them, everyone, everyone was bad. And so if you hate Ozil or if you hate Alexis or if you think Lacazette's mm-hmm. been a disappointment or if you're down on Bellerin, I mean, you, you could pick on any of them. Clive, I, I'm yeah. going to give my sort of definitive final answer on Alexis uh, after you because I think it's important that we kind of get, you know, the definitive answer. But uh, why don't you take a shot at the Alexis thing before I settle the argument? Oh, I think Tim's nailed a lot of it, to be honest. Um, well, I shit. think <laughs> I think a lot of it, let's be honest, right? a lot of it's wrapped up in the fact that he hasn't signed a contract for us and we question his commitment. So the moment he does anything bad, we we exaggerate it. When he does something good, we like it, but we think, well, you know what, he's going to go soon. So we don't commit our emotions to him. It's almost like, you know, we don't want to fall in love with him because we know he's going he's gonna to let us down. 
right? So why are we going to overcommit emotionally to him, right? So it's much easier to try and hate him because then when he goes, we're, we're protecting our feelings going forward. And that's what's happening. We look at the facts of the game as it was, was highlighted by Tim and by Agent Clark today. Everything that we did good was down to he had a part to play in it. Um, yes, some of the dribbling they did across the face, going square across midfield and getting dispossessed, that was almost disrespectful to your teammates there were square passes on there and you just chose to hold it and hold it and hold it until you lost it then you chase after it well people are not impressed with that anymore we've seen you chase after lost causes before so that doesn't work anymore lay the ball off trust your teammates get it back into good areas and, and go from there and I think a lot of that's down to just the stylist to other players we have around him I don't think he trusts very many of them I think we all know he passes to Ozil he actually passes to Jack Wilshire a lot actually I think he trusts him technically and there's some players he likes there's some players that he don't and, he can, and it's obvious you can see it fans can see it and that's why he polarise his views so I think Tim's nailed a lot of that for me I like him but I don't think he's ever emotionally invested into Arsenal. It was always a three-year stop for him. And we've made him stay three and a half, four years, and he doesn't like it. And um, this is what we're getting. And I'll be happy when we have... It's quite interesting watching Man City yesterday. They're two flagship players, Silva and De Bruyne, in the middle of their team, protected by Fernandinho. Everyone trusts them. Everyone gives them the ball. Everyone knows they are the people that run that team. And our two flagship players are higher up in the team, not in the middle third, they're in the top end third. And they are, positionally, they are maybe away from the heart of the team, but they are the emotional heart of the team. And emotionally, we're not sure about them. So as fans, that's why we polarise. Yeah. Um, when they're in the right areas, near Lacazette, we look fantastic. When they're not we don't look so good we look disconnected we don't create enough chances and, and that normally happens away from home so I've always said a formation change away from home to having two forwards and one in behind is what I'd like to see rather than a, a 2-1 if you see what I mean and I'd rather get connection with Lacazette and, and play in the higher up areas a lot more where our flagship players are but we don't tend to do that so, yeah, look. so there you go so that's my definitive mate fair enough I, I thought it was decent um, I think look the, thank you <laughs> the, <laughs> um there's a lot wrong with Alexis right now, and he's definitely not in his best form, but he, we've all seen it. He collects the ball, and he takes that one dribble inside, and he looks up, and he takes another dribble inside, and he looks up, and he tries to beat another man and looks up, and the reason he keeps looking up is nobody's making a run. <laughs> you know, I mean, he loves to play a through ball. Here's a really amazing statistic. Since 2014-15 season, he's played 149 through balls. That's the most in the Premier League. Fabregas is second with 93, so 56 fewer, okay? Almost a third fewer. Uh, more than a third fewer. But Fabregas has completed just one fewer, 40 to 39. So he's hitting through balls at an astonishing rate, but they're not connecting. I don't think Alexis's problem is that he's selfish. I think Alexis's problem is that he wants to win the game every time the ball's on his foot. He wants to score a stunning goal, or he wants to create a stunning goal. And that's a great instinct. And to Tim's point... I think if you're 18 yards from goal, you can play that way. If you're 40 yards from goal, you can't. And this is one of the problems with the back three that I think we have to revisit. With the one fewer player, that may not have been English, but go with me, um, in midfield, Alexis is dropping deeper, and he's collecting the ball off the wing backs 40 yards from goal, or he's collecting it from the, you know, from Shaka or whatever the case may be, or, or even off Nacho or, or Koscielny, um, and he's... He's 40, 41 yards. I mean, his average starting position this season is 44. His average touch is 44 yards from their goal. And in that position, carrying it too long, getting dispossessed, making bad passes can hurt you. The other problem is this is our best scorer. I mean, with all due respect to Lacazette, who I adore, Alexis Sanchez is still better at scoring goals than him, and he's not getting on the end of moves. And so we are emphasizing his flaws, right? His wayward passing, his desire to do too much with the ball, and we are de-emphasizing his best qualities, which is his ability to create chances and finish chances by virtue of where he is having to collect the ball on the pitch. And so we need to find a way to push him closer to goal, as Tim alluded to, as the manager alluded to, and that may be going to a back for again and adding another midfielder someone who can get between the lines a little bit and get the ball to Alexis in more advanced spaces um, he's not overlapping or he's not playing with uh, Kolasinac anymore he's just not Kolasinac and, 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 and Alexis were exchanging the ball well at the very beginning of the season It's or, or maybe it was when Alexis wasn't even playing really there's no overlapping going on there and so there's no width 
He's just not getting the ball in the right spots. Um, you know, I do think... Well, Kolasinac, he, yeah. he, he stopped running, he stopped he stopped, running for yeah, it. Yeah, he stopped running too. He, he hasn't been running. overlapping. And I wonder, yep. you know, I do wonder if that's an instruction, Clive, to be a defense against the Alexis turnovers a little bit. You know, the idea Maybe. that if he overlaps and Alexis gives the ball away, we're too vulnerable. So when Alexis starts doing your, his cut inside move, Kolasinac has been instructed to stay a little deeper. Um, one, one thing that I think is misleading, you guys... People quote these turnover stats like, oh, he turned the ball over 33 times, 32 times, and it sounds like a lot. Mm -hmm. It's important to remember that those include misplaced passes, okay? That's not him just giving the ball away, um, you know, being dispossessed or or dribbling it off his feet. Sterling was dispossessed nine times at Old Trafford, and that is the highest total in the league this season for dispossessed, okay? They won that game, and Sterling was just fine in it. So... You you can lose the ball a lot and still be having a good game. The other problem is this is where we need a Rick and Morty style dimension portal, a portal gun. You know, everyone said Alexis should have been subbed. And I agree. You know what? In a pure meritocracy based on his performance, you guys, he should have been subbed off. He was having a bad game. And yet he creates the winning goal. Now, what we can't see is the dimension where he does get subbed off and we play a lot better and the ball's moving faster and maybe we get two or three goals. So we don't know what would have happened. But this is why it's hard to take him off the pitch because he does. He pops up with a decisive moment and few players have that ability to be having a stinker and still pop up with with a decisive moment. So he did. And that leads us to the substitutes and, and sort of what happened in the last half hour of the game. I mean, Tim, two questions. Do you think the manager was too slow to make changes and do you think he made the right changes? Um, do you know, it's funny, actually, he referenced, and I'm sure this was uh, with reference to a criticism he often gets, but he was talking about the Ramsey injury, and he said, yeah, that's the risk of making early substitutions. Um, well, especially when you have Aaron Ramsey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I um, See, I thought Welbeck wouldn't have been my first choice. I thought Welbeck made sense when Giroud was on as well. Why um, was Welbeck actually, brought in to play wide? I didn't understand that at yeah. all. Like you weren't gonna, he's not gonna play through them. That's not his quality. Yeah. If he's not in the box. If but he not, can, but he can run through them, and that's what we weren't from, doing. From a wide we position, we weren't running through lines, yeah. and that's the thing we missed. That's why it was all in front. We had no one to run through. Colosinic wasn't running through. Bellerin was only running running on the break. So we had no one to cut in behind. So when they, those chip passes had no targets. Right? So you don't, so, you yeah. don't think... You don't think we we needed the the one more dagger ball, the one more the one more needle player, you know, bring bring in Wilshire. Yeah. Oh, well, anyway, hang on. Let, let's let Tim finish his thoughts on it, and then we'll steer it over to you, Clive, and, and you can correct us. Yeah, I mean, so like Alexis had a bit of a target for those dink balls over the top when Giroud and Welbeck were both on, because then Welbeck kind of pushed in almost like a second striker because he knew. Right, everyone knows Giroud can head the ball, so he's going to have three defenders around him trying to rip his shirt off. So, you know, maybe I can get something. And like I said, with the Giroud goal, Welbeck was there on the shoulder. Um, so I, I think in a game where um, one of your substitutes gets the equaliser, it's it's difficult to really um, to to kind of really critique the substitutions too much. Completely understand why he went Wilshire for Xhaka. I thought that was fine. Um, we needed someone at that stage probably to carry the ball. Which uh, which Wilshire did, and I think he did it fine. We had to try and do something a bit different. Um, yeah, I mean, well, Beck's maybe the only one to question, just because he's really not playing well um, since he came back from this this most recent injury. Um, the others, yeah, I, I put it this way: I didn't have um, I didn't have any better ideas myself. Yeah, I, I guess that's a fair point. I just, um, you know, I mean, you could make the argument, and I thought Lacazette was fading. He was running out of ideas, yeah. but I mean, he's your fifty million pound striker, yada yada yada, narrative narrative. But like, he he is a great finisher, and and I guess the question is like, should we have gone to just more of a pure two two up front? He left Lacazette on um, mm. to play next to Giroud, you know, something like that. I mean, Clive, do you feel it was handled the right way, the wrong way? I mean, what did you make of of this? The yeah, subs? I I did I did think the subs were fine. I I, I honestly and I I thought the order of them was fine as well. I, I was looking at the game. I was really frustrated at our lack of running through lines. I was hoping for a dribbler, and that and the only dribbler we had was the one that was losing the ball all the time. So I was a bit frustrated there. So when Welbeck came on, I was hoping that he would start to make some darts. He made a couple. He was active. 
It wasn't as successful as I hoped, but I understood why he was the first one. Drew for Lacazette, that made sense. He was tiring and he was just running out of ideas. And Jack could have come on for either Shaka or Ramsey. In hindsight, I wish it was Ramsey because I don't want to see him injured um, because he broke down later. So we lost we lost that player in there. So um, but it didn't really matter because Southampton had settled by then so we could just push him back. And I thought Jack did fine. He carried the ball. He was trusted. And I felt Alexis went higher up when Jack was there because Jack can manipulate the ball. He gives you what Tim always talks about. He gives you that technical security. And when people see that, they, they don't do it themselves. And, was, and Alexis picks the ball up on the edge of the area, not, not 10 yards deep, and he digs the ball into the middle. I was fine with it. I was more upset about the first 10 minutes of the game rather than the last 10 minutes. I thought the first 10 minutes were down to lack of preparation and focus, as I said earlier. And I think the formation-wise, Elliot, I think we, we're linking a lot to the back three. You can still, when you have the back three, you have width. We haven't got lots of people happy in wide areas. So but by not having the back three, we're going to lose something. We're going to have our full backs higher. We're going to be exposed on the recovery speed in the, in the corners that we have been year on year. I think what we've got to do away from home is potentially play with two strikers. Get Ozil off the side. Get him into areas where he can be trusted in the centre of the pitch. And then I think Alexis and Lacazette can play higher. So that's where I think we need to move towards. I said it before, we need to try to get those three slightly So it becomes more of a 3 4 2 home. 1, a 3 4 1 2 instead of a 3 4 it's, 2 1. Exactly, exactly okay. that. So Ozil becomes a true number 10. He's then running the game from the center of the pitch and playing passes to two active people that trust him to do it. And that's how we're going to get Alexis high, not by having an extra midfielder to clog it up. And then he's got no one to pass through in wide areas. So that's what I hope for until we get the dominant centre-backs we need, till we get that true defensive midfielder that we need, so we can move to a more of a Man City PSG style 4 3 3, which is my ultimate dream, but I'm not sure if Wenger buys into it. It's almost like you're suggesting, and I don't want to put words into your mouth, but just having a bunch of forwards standing in a straight line across the 18 yard box isn't the ideal. But, you know, <laughs> what, what do I know? Um, <laughs> Well, look, we did get the goal, and and we got the goal to equalize, and Tim, after the game, the manager was, was very blunt about it. Olivier Giroud will play more. Um, mm. My question to you is why? And look, I realize it's kind of become a meme, a trope, uh, a joke. Yeah, Elliot hates Olivier Giroud. Here's his chance to beat up on him. But, like, we know what Olivier Giroud gives us. There's a reason we bought Lacazette. There's a reason he's been trying to buy a striker. Like, if Giroud's going to come in and play, it's going to be at the expense of Lacazette. We're not suddenly going to go back to 4-4-2, okay? He, he mm. can't play Lacazette, I wouldn't think, in one of the two behind the striker. And even if he was thinking of that, would you rather Lacazette play there than Alexis or Ozil? I don't think so. So it's like, it's hard for me to understand that statement, especially in the context of the fact that, like, Look, I realize this wasn't our best day from an attacking standpoint, but since we've started going with Lacazette, Alexis, and Ozil, I don't think anyone would suggest that the attack is the problem. That, you know, what we really no. need to do is find a way to fix our flagging attack. Like, that's not the problem. You're going to have games like this where you fall behind, they defend in a low block. Look at Chelsea. Chelsea just lost 1-0 away to West Ham. You know, like, this shit happens. So, mm. I mean, what do you make of, of the manager's... Giroud will play more comment. I mean, we know he loves the player, and we do know that when it's his favorites, he finds a way to get them back into the team. Do you think this is maybe just kind of a convenient time for him to say that because with fixture congestion, he's going to have to do it anyway? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I should preface this by saying someone stopped me on the train uh, on the way back from Southampton. and uh, said, said, are you that guy from the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast? That's awesome. N- not not quite, no. He said, I bet Elliot's head exploded um, when Giroud scored. Uh, <laughs> You're kidding me, really? So No, 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 Damn. absolutely true. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm sure the gentleman in question will make himself known and tweet. <laughs> but, I, I will yeah. tell you that, look, I, I was as happy as anyone when he scored. And I mean, this, this is the problem with having players that aren't your favorite. Like, like, I actually think when we need to pump, we. I, the funny thing is, I had just tweeted before the goal, we need to start bump, pumping balls into the box. And when yeah, we're chasing yeah. a game against a packed defense, I think Olivier Giroud is brilliant because he's either yeah. going to win one of those headers for a goal or he's going to knock it down and it's loose in the box. And when there's a yeah. scramble for those, that second ball, that's where you can break down a, a congested area because it's harder to be organized. It's just a question of whether from the start he makes sense yeah. given the options we have. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, so I think um, it's it's a couple of things. First off, it's, you know, um, we've got a lot of games coming up and, you know, we've got a Carabao Cup game coming up as well. So um, I'm sure he will start that. Um, so, you know, he's not 
necessarily uh, telling any lies there when he says that he's going to play more. But, you know, we're, we're coming into a period now where there are two games a week. He is, is going to have to change it around. And, um, yeah, so he, he probably will. Um, he'll probably have to start at some point. But also, you know, the player himself is still very coy about where he sees his future in January. He's still, you know, he just decided to stay this summer. And, you know, things haven't really gone the way he would have wanted them to go at this stage. So, and and he's even now after this game, he's said, you know, I'll, I'll see what opportunities there are, I think was his phrase. So there's there's an element to which he's probably trying to keep him on side. And that, that probably will stretch into trying to keep him on side by giving him a game or two. Whether that goes beyond West Ham in the Carabao Cup and Nottingham Forest in the FA Cup, we'll see. Wouldn't be surprised if he started um, one of the games over Christmas, maybe Palace or West Brom um, or something like that. Um, and and also, you know, if Lacazette gets injured, then it's either him or Welbeck up front. So, you know, he's he's not that far down in the squad that, that he's really saying something totally unimaginable. Um, you are also right. He he will try and find his way. You know, we were having this discussion this time last year with Alexis. You know, is is it all over for Giroud? And then he started to introduce him over Christmas for rotation purposes. And after that, he was kind of like, oh, yeah, go on, then I'll keep you in. Um, and and there is, of course, a, a, I don't think there's as much of a risk of that now, uh, having paid so much money for Lacazette mm-hmm. and. This, if Giroud doesn't go in January, I think he'll certainly go in the summer. Um, so you know, we are kind of, you know, he's 31 years old and he's coming to the end of his Arsenal career basically. So I don't think the temptation is quite there. He he might he might in December and January, you know, try and keep him sweet, keep him in the cup games. If we get to the semi final of the Carabao Cup, there's two more games there in January that that he can give him. So. Um, I think there may be an element of that, but I think there's probably a bit of politics going on here as well. Yeah, that's fair. Um, and that's kind of his job too. So, you know, I, mm. I get that. Um, Clive, the more important issue that I'll leave for you to answer um, is what we do with Ramsey out now. I mean, we don't know exactly how long it's going to be, but I mean, the manager always at a minimum had to have it in his mind that at some point Ramsey's going to do his hamstring. So here's his chance to prove that you know he's he's fully prepared for this inevitability is this i mean my feeling is the only midfield two that even remotely works in this back three is um ramsey and shaka and that's by no way meant to be praised for shaka for the record um but it's it's just the two that has seemed to be the only functional two in this system is the solution a three-man midfield where two people basically replace the role of Ramsey or is there someone you think can come in and do the job he does? I think, um, you know, this game has really presented a lot more questions than, than answers, really. I think um, I put that exact exact poll on Twitter about who would you replace and, and I, th- I I hope he puts Jack in there. I think I think he can do that job. I think he'll do it differently. He won't be running past the centre forward. He'll be controlling the centre of the pitch, and I'm I'm a fan of that. So I'd like to see Jack get a go at West Ham. I like to see, you know, away from home. I still like to see that just that one change. Of hopefully Mustafi comes back. I think the back three only works well when he's there in the centre. So that's how I see it going. He might go three. But he he might bring a Wobi in and then take a player out from the back. I mean, I think this game brought a lot of questions. I'm I'm generally not sure. But you know what Wenger like? He'll he'll bring in Cockerland. He'll bring in Cockerland because he wants security. He won't want to. He won't want to give up any more. I can hear silence. <laughs> but I, I can see, I can see I can sense it. Right? He'll, I'm going to let you finish Cockerland. before I stomp all over. <laughs> <laughs> I can just hear. It's like you just went to the drawer to get a knife out, right? So like, um, I can, I can, hear, I can, I you know, I think, I hope it's Jack because I think we'll we'll look after the ball, and once we start looking after the ball against against West Ham, they'll just drop back and we'll have them. I hope he doesn't play Giroud at West Ham, because I want us to make sure that we can threaten them in behind. If he does play Giroud, then 
crazy as it sounds, you've got to bring Theo Walcott back to make sure we can stretch teams and we've got targets in there. So if you bring Giroud back, don't just drop him for Lacazette because the movement is not the same. Our game has to change. We have two major players in Mertesacker and Giroud. When we bring them in, so much changes when we bring them in. You know, yeah. every... Monrie- and Koscielny you have to change their game massively we stand 10 yards further back his movements to go and press are so slow so we have to react to that when Giroud plays our whole forward line is 10 yards higher up it's not where we want it to be and so we then have to try to work our way back so they're both good players in their time but when they come in they massively change our, our, our style and how we play and they change so many other people's games and their potential output. So if you bring them in, give them their old faithfuls around them. Get Welbeck on one side, get Wal- Walcott the other, and then Giroud can do his thing and we can run him behind down the sides. And that's when, that's when you do need a four at the back to make that work. And, and if you know, rather than bringing Mertz, like it's time to bring in hold and so we, we can still be aggressive in our back line and we don't leave big spaces in midfield. I mean, these are things I'd like to see happen, but um, watch out for Cockland on Wednesday night. Yeah, for fuck's sake. Yeah, I mean, it, it, look... I think everything you said makes sense. I I think it is marginal right now as to whether the back three is giving us any extra defensive solidity for the midfield control it gives up and, and maybe the better spacing in the attack that it gives up. The one thing I would suggest is that the bright spot of our season has been the way we've attacked using Ramsey, uh, uh, Lacazette, Alexis, and Ozil. And that has been... That has been really encouraging and led me to believe that we will break into the top four, that we are one of the four best teams in England, and that we can kind of restore our position in the Champions League before we lose Alexis Nozel. With Ramsey out, I, I think it is the perfect opportunity to say, you know, the way he plays that role with his running, he really does the job of two players. And I mean, Tim, I, I'm, I'm ready to kind of close up with a, a couple final questions here, unless you want to just quickly chime in on your mm. thoughts of how to, how to replace uh, Ramsey during his absence. Um. Basically, we're going to have to do something quite drastically different because we haven't got anyone that does what Ramsey does, and whoever we bring in is going to be completely different. Can Jack do um, it if if they if they maintain that role of one pushed up and one sitting deep? I mean, Jack doesn't have the legs that Ramsey has. He can't cover the ground. No. He does. N- no. no. Yeah. Okay. And I, not well, not I, a Wobie, right? He doesn't have the engine for I it. I mean, if if Jack does it, I I worry about Jack and Jacker in terms of mobility and recovery. Um, that I think they'd both have to sit pretty tight together and Jack would really and I think this is one of the things Jack's adjusting to he's got to pick his moments now he can't burst forward every single time he gets the ball he's got to be a bit mature and and pick the right time um, to do it one or two times a game Um, I'm not sure he's quite got that yet that's not to say he can't or won't get it but I don't think he's there yet um, you know, we might have to go to a midfield three. If we do a midfield three, though, getting Wilshire and Urzel into the centre is is going to be very very tricky. Because if you have Urzel, you know, if we go back to the four two three one and we have Wilshire and Jacker with Urzel ahead of them, it's still a midfield two. It doesn't. No, then solve he's then he's going to go Cochrane and Shaka, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, or El Nenny and Shaka. So yeah. I, I I think he Agreed might that. put. Cockerlan back in on Wednesday and maybe play Jack against Newcastle. I think that may be the and, and that may be a better way of doing it. I still I'm still not sure that Jack Wilshire has the athleticism to play central midfield from the start. But you know this is a good chance for him to prove that he can. If he doesn't, if he doesn't start in this period, I think it tells you the decision is already made on his future. If he starts and doesn't impress in this period, then I think he's he's basically kind of done at Arsenal, really. Um, so th- it's going to be fascinating to see. But whatever we do, it's going to be a pretty drastic change for us. And you know, to Clive's point about we've we've had this before, you know, where we've we've got a kind of starting eleven going, and then someone drops out, and then we drop someone in who does a completely different job in a completely different way. Uh, and I am worried about this. I think Ramsey's been superb over the last yes, month. I actually yes. thought he was really good yesterday as well, to be honest. I don't um, think he was bad. I just thought he struggled to uh, get into the, the hurtful spaces and attack that he usually does. He had the, yeah. one, the one run that Alexis found him for the, the low save, but that was about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and I thought that was a terrific save, by the way. That it was, yeah. the equaliser, really. But, I mean, he hit it right where yeah. you're supposed to, low in the corner. I mean, it was... Yeah, uh, indeed. I, I think that I, so I think we'll see Coquelin on Wednesday and we'll share on Saturday that's my prediction but um, 
I, to be honest, I don't know what I'd do because whatever we do, it's it's kind of it's a major bit of surgery, and we've not we've not really been used to doing that this season. Certainly not in midfield. Ramsey and Jacker have, have started most of the games. Um, I think Jacker started every game. In the well, and, and this is the scary thing. I mean, even the players who are bad, who have been bad, I think Shaq has been pretty poor. I think we have to say yeah. there's no analog for them. There's no replacement no. who can come in from that second team that that is close enough in quality or skill set to match the job they're doing and we talked about this tim in the europa league the second 11 don't mm. fit a back three the way the first 11 no. do you know the other thing that scares me without ramsey is look ozil has a lot of fantastic qualities he's not you wouldn't say a natural goal scorer alexis is and lacazette is i think when you take ramsey out you have to ask yourself do we have enough goals in the side um and so mm. you know i really worry about sticking with the back three and removing Ramsey and putting someone like Coughlin in who has no goal threat, obviously has never yeah. scored a goal for us, then you're really, you know, you're emphasizing the thing about Alexis you say you hate the most, which is putting all the pressure on him again. Um, yeah. I think it can exacerbate our problems. Look, I, I don't want to get too long here, but we do have to at least cover mm. this, I think. Um, and Clive, I'll let you get the first word and, and we'll move on. Um, it's a 1-1 draw it's at Southampton. I realize they haven't been great this season. We gave them an early goal and we battled and we battled and we battled and we battled and we got a point. Um, Chelsea lost at West Ham. United lost to City. Uh, Liverpool drew against an Everton team at home that we beat away like 72 to nil. So I, I realize it was like 5-1. But the moral of the story is like bad results get thrown up in the Premier League and getting a point out of that actually in the context of what we're trying to achieve this season is just fine. Like I, it's not what I wanted. It's not what we should hope for. And it, it wasn't the performance we wanted. But have... Have we gotten way too granular in the way we analyze the team on a game-to-game -game basis? I mean, is this is this a really bad result, any really bad performance that should send shockwaves through the team, or is this one that we should shrug off, be thankful for the point, and move on? Uh, the latter. We should shrug it off. I mean, I would have loved the point at Watford and Stoke that we deserved that we didn't get, we couldn't execute, and we should have got points there. We were well beaten at City, and, and we, you know, we just what we got there but those two games really annoy me we, des we deserve what we got at Anfield as well and th we didn't need to lose them because we were, we, were, we were better and we managed to throw those games away right so um, so we didn't throw this one away completely first goals really count in the Premier League and we need to start games properly it's amazing we've recovered the, more points from, from trailing this season than any other team in the Premier League so we, we need to yeah. stop trailing and maybe those recovered stop. points become wins yeah <laughs> Exactly, and you know, for all of the fantastic, exhilarating attacking play we saw against Manchester United, it's quite interesting that this team, the thing they took forward into this game was the ten minutes at the start, and and we let that affect us. It's amazing management that we can't manage to take the positives we saw. We got we had fans clapping the team off against Manchester United, but we managed to take the insecurities into this game which I find really disappointing that we can't take the positives out as a fan group I, I am taking the positives out of this game because we scored late we didn't lose it and we just need to chill sometimes and just say you know what that didn't work out can we learn the lessons can we work out strategy away from home can we start game sharper what do you need to do to get Alexis higher up the pitch let's fix the problems that fix the problems that this game gave us Let's see if we can do that against West Ham and against Newcastle and go from there. Yeah, I mean, simple tactical things to correct. When Nacho or Koscielny has the ball 25 yards from their own goal, it shouldn't be Shaka standing 30 yards from them bracketed by two players and Ramsey not even in the shot. Like, I know there's no such thing as a shot for you, Tim, because you're actually at the stadium, but <laughs> for me, that's, that's a thing that happens on the TV screen. In any event, um, Tim, I, I assume you don't need a big uh, soliloquy on this. You agree we've probably overstated the uh, doom and gloom around this game? Yeah, I mean, you know, like in a, in a season, it, it happens, you know, in a season, it, it's disappointing that we basically gave away a, a, a goal start because had we not done that, like, um, I really, you know, goals change games and everything. I don't think this goal really did change the game. I'm projecting here, you know, because it's completely hypothetical and we'll never know. But I don't think that goal really did change the game. It probably changed the first 10 minutes and put the wind in Southampton sails. I think the pattern of the game would have been exactly the same at nil-nil. Um, I think they'd have just had, you know, had that low block defended and tried to hit us on the counter, which they did quite well. They created quite a few chances. Um, I think the game would have been exactly like that at nil-nil. And basically, 
um, you know, we would have banged and banged the door down and we might have got a late winner and it might have been a late one nil win instead of late one all. But you know what, in in, in a season the, the risk of stating the obvious, sometimes you play well, sometimes you play a bit you play meh, sometimes you play badly, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, sometimes you draw. This was a pretty meh performance and, you know, we got a draw away from home and I think Clive's right. That would have been great against Watford. Um that would have been fine against Stoke as well if we'd have got like a late equaliser there. Um, we had plenty of games like this in the unbeaten season. We drew 12 games and quite a lot of them were like this. They were like pretty middling away draws. Um, obviously, you know, I'm not trying to compare this season to that season. Um, but, you know, it, it's just, I just find this desire to find everything that isn't a resounding win as a total crisis. I just find it I don't know. I find it really, really tiresome, to be honest. I, I think this is just yeah. a completely forgettable away draw that I probably won't remember in two to three weeks' time. And that's fine. You're going to get those in a season. Um, it's it's just that it, it's pretty much unavoidable. And that's what happened on this occasion. That's yeah. not to say the team shouldn't take the lessons out of it and you know pick the bones out of it. But I, I don't think we really, as fans, need to... You know, need to really stress ourselves so much about everything that isn't, you know, particularly when we don't really seem to enjoy the wins either. <laughs> kind of write them off as routine. You know, this this to me is the sort of game you write off as routine and just go, yeah, okay, away draw. We kind of got away with it, um, but we kept plugging away. We changed it up a bit. We put the big striker on and got a one-one. Fine, let's get out of there. Um, really, and and you know, the Burnley game was very nearly like this. <laughs> Um, but for a last minute penalty so you know it's it's one of those games there were some good there were some bad it's an away point at a team who typically finishes up a mid table it's, it's not the end of the world yeah and look I mean there were some nearly moments and right towards the end oh so frustrating there's a ball into the box that was about to drop onto I think it was Giroud's foot and Ramsey kind of like back flicked it softly to Forrester um, typical Ramsey arriving in the box late to try to flick in a goal with like a torn hamstring, but um, and and uh, he took it right off the foot of Giroud, which could have been a tap in, and man, the celebration alone would have been worth it. Um, pure blockbuster, I'm sure. In any event, uh, real quick bookkeeping: it's Ostersund. Is that how we pronounce it? Ostersund. I've got no idea. Okay, it's Ostersund in the Europa League. Um, I think it's a good draw. I mean, look. I realize fighting for top four doesn't have anybody on the edge of their seat, but it should mean that at a time when Chelsea and United and Spurs and Liverpool uh, are, are just crammed with important fixtures and have no room to rotate, that we can probably send our second 11 to the cold, uh, you know, fjords mm. of Ostersund, if there are fjords there. If not, I apologize. <laughs> anyway, the, the Northern Lights, how about that? Right? They have that, right? The Northern Lights? I I, I don't Still know. don't know. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody. We're we're doing our Swedish listeners You're proud. Questions that we can't this, answer. This is fantastic. Um, well, in any. Well, I do know. What I do know. Spurs play. Uh, they play us and, and Juventus in a very close proximity. So, there you go. Yeah. Well, so so while so while Theo Walcott is scoring goals under the Aurora Borealis, we'll be able to have Alexis and Ozil <laughs> wrapped in cotton wool, um, or you know, City will be able to have them wrapped in cotton wool, whatever. In any event, um, we'll be back after uh, West Ham at the weekend, not at the weekend, at midweek, uh, when Francis Coughlin will create and score three goals himself. In any event, uh, Tim's on Twitter at Stoberto. Thanks, Tim. My pleasure. Clive's on Twitter at Clive PAFC. Thanks, Clive. No? Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. you got to say goodbye. We can't end the pod till you do it. Uh, my name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. Give us a five-star review and write nasty things about Paul in the comments section. It should be easy. I can help you if you need anything. Reach out to me on Twitter. I kid, I kid. In any event, uh, thank you guys for listening. We love you. And we will uh, talk to you after Arsenal 10, West Ham No. 